Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help you thrive as a cyber risk manager. On today's episode, your virtual chief information security officer is Kip Boyle, and your virtual cybersecurity counsel is Jake Bernstein. Visit them at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. So, Kip, what are we going to talk about today? Hi, Jake. Today, we are going to talk with our guest. His name is Michael Garcia. He's back again. Uh, he was here about three episodes ago, and he uh, he's going to talk to us about a new set of recommendations. Previously, we talked with Michael about the fact that um, that we're outgunned, cyber criminals are running rings around us, and Michael ha- came and talked to us about this report that had some recommendations for the, for the federal government. Well, Michael's been very busy, and now he's back to talk about uh, something else that's totally relevant. These are recommendations that are released by the Institute for Security and Technology. He was on a ransomware task force, and I couldn't resist bringing him back right away because I believe that the that the report that they released has some really good information to help us uh, understand the growing threat of ransomware and what actually needs to be done about it. But first, Jake, we need to mention one last time to tell our audience about our upcoming continuing legal education. That's right. Uh, please join us online for a one-hour cutting-edge CLE on June 23rd, 2021 at noon Pacific time, where Kip and I will teach you how to begin to guide your clients whenever the topic of ransomware comes up. That's right. So this is a continuing legal education session. So it's you know it's really uh, designed primarily for attorneys, but we're going to use ordinary language. So it's not going to be tech jargon. It's not going to be legal jargon. So really anybody can join us. If you're at all interested, then I would invite you to uh, to sign up. But what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through two actual ransomware incidents that Jake and I have handled recently. We're going to tell you how the attack started, how the victim recovered, and we're going to talk about the role of the attorney throughout the incident. In addition to one CLE credit, you'll receive actionable advice that you can use right away. All right. So how do you sign up for this amazing session that we're going to be giving? We go to b.link forward slash CLE. So that's the letter B dot L-I-N-K forward slash CLE. And again, designed for attorneys, but all are welcome. All right, let's go ahead and get back to the episode. We're talking to Michael Garcia and the recommendations from the ransomware task force that he was a member of. So, Michael, welcome back. Glad to be back. So even though you were here just three episodes ago, um, maybe some of our listeners haven't heard that episode. So would you reintroduce yourself and give us a little bit of your background? Absolutely. Please? So my name is Michael Garcia. I'm a senior policy advisor for a DC based think tank called third way where I work in their national security program, but I primarily focus on cyber crime issues. So at third way, I spend a majority of my time doing research and writing papers on a whole host of cyber criminal activities and uh, ransomware being one of them. I've been at Third Way now for about a year, and prior to that, I worked for a congressional commission called the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which was congressionally mandated to look at how the U.S. can improve its overall cybersecurity posture and how the federal government can work with both international, state and local, and private partners to achieve that end. And prior to that, I spent a number of years working at an organization called the National Governors Association, where I traveled the country advising governor's offices on how to create cybersecurity strategies and executive orders to improve their own state's cyber defenses. Uh, so that's basically me in a nutshell. And like I said, I'm really happy to be back on the program. Great. And and Michael, it's, it's great to have you back. Now, if I recall, uh, Colonial Pipeline hadn't happened when we last had you on the show. So, you know, I think the, the urgency of, of this, this issue is really, I mean, it can't be can't be overstated. This is this has become a national security concern, um, which I think Kip and I and, and you were well aware of before Colonial Pipeline happened. But uh, you know, it that clarifies, or I think proves to anyone who didn't believe that ransomware is a growing threat to the U.S. economy. And 
you know, I think we have to admit that the actual losses are a lot higher than what's been published in most news outlets, simply because most ransomware attacks are not reported. What kind of impact are you seeing with your visibility? Yeah, no, you are absolutely right. I think it was kind of prescient. We had that conversation back in April, and then sure enough, a month later, we had the most consequential uh, ransomware attack in the U.S. of Colonial. And then just this past weekend, uh, over Memorial Day weekend, we saw one of the world's largest meat suppliers, JBS, get hit with ransomware. And sure enough, just how like Colonial impacted the oil supply for all of those who live on the East Coast in the U.S., this will surely going to impact um, people who buy any kind of meat products from chicken, pork, beef. Um, so this is now directly impacting um, Americans uh, where, where it hits them most and just basic day commodities. But I think the interesting thing is that uh, COVID-19 really accelerated the use of ransomware because you have cyber criminals realizing that everybody's shifting their lives to online, whether that's uh, doing telecommunications, uh, having com uh, video conferences like this that we're having right now, uh, remote school learning. And so what we saw was an increase of 148% um, in these attacks uh, with over 2,400 government entities being hit. So looking at hospitals, schools, uh, local government entities in general. And as a result, uh, criminals know that they can get more out of their victims. So real quick, I want to break down kind of the numbers because I think it's really interesting when you, when you look at this. And that in Q3 of 2018, the average ransomware price was about $6,000. Only two years later in 2020, Q3, that was over $230,000. And by just a simple estimate, we, could, we see about $350 million in ransomware in 2020 alone. And Jake, to your point, that's probably just the tip of the iceberg because it's not always reported. And so we're seeing this a, a growing uh, attack on various en enterprises, and it's increasingly hitting uh, Americans where it hits the most, and it's uh, oil, uh, their groceries, as well as telehealth and schools. Well, it's barbecue season too, so <laughs> yeah, <I> mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The this biggest is just, barbecue. This, this is just not acceptable. <laughs> well, gosh, you know, this is um, it's. It's just stunning how ransomware has um, has risen as as an issue, as a cyber issue for our, our country, and and I think it's just another data point uh, that is making our case that we are just wildly outgunned by the criminals right now. And one of the reasons why this is happening, I think a lot of people are, are confused about you know why this is happening. I think it's a conf, uh, confluence of a couple of things. One is is that the criminals are just getting more and more efficient at conducting these kinds of attacks. They're, they've honed their weapons. They've honed their, their procedures. They understand how to silently slip into a network and operate in there uh, without making any noise for days to weeks. And they can do a lot of intelligence gathering on their victims to find out what they really can pay, what their liquid assets are, and what they can really afford to pay in terms of a ransom. Um, so, so there's that side, and I think also the other thing that is that is really enabled this is the availability of anonymous cryptocurrency transactions has been a huge enabler because ransomware is not new. Ransomware has been going on for years and years and years, but it's the availability of cryptocurrency and anonymous transactions at scale uh, globally that has really opened the door to to these attacks. Yeah, and I think just to add to that point too, is that you're seeing what's been called ransomware as a service in which you have these large criminal syndicates that operate usually out of Eastern Europe or in Russia, which was in the case of the Colonial Pipeline incident, who rent out their ransomware. So if you just have any access to the dark web, which is really easy, people can Google it, then you can pay a small fee to access ransomware and hit any victim that you like. And all you have to do is send a small percentage back. So I think that also uh, just basically taking a criminal enterprise model, which we've seen before in various other uh, crimes, putting in a ransomware, it makes it that much more impactful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So what's happening is the criminal element is specializing, they're scaling they are trying to figure out how to bring in affiliates. So 
here's the thing that most people don't understand, even if they've heard about what you just said, Michael, is that if you want to be an affiliate to a ransomware gang, some people think, wow, you must really you know, have a lot of skills. No. If you can open up a Netflix account and, and figure out how to find a movie you like and play it, you have all the skills you need to become an affiliate. <laughs> it's a really, really low bar. And guess what? If you know how to steal credit cards, you don't even have to pay anything. <laughs> right? So, I mean, the, the, the barriers to entry are super, super low. And in case anybody's wondering, the most recent statistic I saw is only three out of every 1,000 reported cybercrimes of all types actually result in any kind of an arrest I'm not even talking about a conviction. I'm just talking about an arrest, right? And not every arrest results in a in a conviction. So the um, the consequences here, right, of getting caught are ridiculously low. So anyway, so that's why Michael's been on the podcast before. That's why he's here again, because we need to figure out what to do about this, right? So Michael, you are on a ransomware task force uh, as part of the Institute for Security and Technology. So I wanted to ask you to share with our audience, first of all, who who is the Institute? Why did they form a task force and and decide to write this report? And then would you also talk about who the target audience yeah, is? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to refer to the Institute as IST because it's a very long mouthful and I think it'll be, it'll be easier. But IST is basically a nonprofit that helps other uh, companies or organizations with their cybersecurity needs. So they have a whole host of offerings. They're a really good organization, um, provide a lot of good products. Um, in my previous jobs, I've known Philip Reiner, who is the executive director for IST. And he reached out back in December of 2020, seeing these trends of ransomware becoming a big issue, yet realizing that back then, you know, we're reporting on it, but it seemed like the government still wasn't paying much attention to it. And he saw a need to convene those in academia and think tanks like myself and other international organizations and law enforcement officials in general to talk about these issues. So from January through April of this year, uh, IST convened 60 plus members where we had robust conversations about ransomware. And we ended up developing 48 policy proposals to achieve four overarching goals that I think your audience will be very familiar with, which is essentially deterring, disrupting, preparing for, and responding to ransomware. And within those four goals, we then have these 48 recommendations that uh, fell within them. And to kind of give your audience a, a sense of who was on this, it was really high high profile. I honestly was you know, very honored to be in, in their presence, frankly. Uh, but we had Michael Daniel, who used to be essentially President Obama's cyber czar and oversaw all cyber activities within the federal government. Uh, we had the first basically cyber diplomat, which was Chris Painter, who uh, worked at the State Department for a number of years in the Obama administration. We had high profile organizations like Microsoft on there, as well as FBI, Secret Service, DHS, and other international federal entities who were on there as well. And our target audience was actually a multitude. Unlike the report that I talked about the first time I was on about Taylor to U.S. Congress and federal government, this was really focused on, in addition to U.S. government, private sector partners, as well as international partners. And so if you look at the report, they do a really good job of saying this action should be implemented by X time frame and it's directed at U.S. government or it's directed at private partner. Uh, and here's the outcome it would have. Mm hmm. So how would you um, just at a high level compare and contrast the third way report that we talked about a couple of episodes ago and, and this report here? It seems like there's a little bit of conceptual overlap, but um, but but for practical purposes, they, they are different. Correct. So there is some overlap because Arthur report was much broader looking at uh, a high level of what can we do in cybercrime in general, and really kind of talking about the tackling and blocking. So for example, we were talking about information sharing last time, very general. This report is really focused on ransomware. So looking at information sharing, what kind of information do we have to share when it comes to ransomware? How do we incentivize people to report ransomware incidents? Because as Jake opened up, there is no mandate that you have to uh, report a ransomware incident or that you paid a ransomware or that insurance companies are facilitating those payments. 
so this report is different in that it touches on how exactly do we take that overarching framework that we talked about, but then uh, conceptualize it for ransomware in general, and also uh, what can private sector entities do uh, in that regard? Okay, got it. So just just to be clear to the for our audience, we've you know we've got Michael back again, but this report is is um, was created as part of a of a of a different uh, organization um, and specifically focused on on ransomware. But I I I think it's interesting that we've got two organizations, and and obviously there's if we just go looking around on Google, we'll probably find a lot more. Uh, trying to spur government into into action and then also the private sector as well, which I think the future of dealing with this, these cyber crimes is going to involve way more private sector uh, cooperation and coordination. Would you say so, Absolutely. Um, and that's why I was really honored to be part of this task force. And like I said, I was only one of, of 60 members, and a lot of the members were private sector partners who were talking about what they do. You, you mentioned earlier about cryptocurrency. We had cryptocurrency experts and we have a whole section about cryptocurrency, which in our report, uh, we did not talk about. So it was really interesting conversations and the report really delves into those kind of issues that our third report did not. Okay. I just want to make one more comment and then, um, and then I think, um, Jake's going to want us to, um, actually start looking at the recommendations of, of your report. But, um, I just wanted to share with the audience that. It struck me, and, and this this uh, something that I thought of a few years ago, that because the criminals are um, <laughs> running amok, I thought, well, you know, when has this happened before? Because this sounds vaguely familiar. And so I thought about, you know, in the United States in the 1920s and the 1930s, I thought about um, armed gangsters robbing banks, right? So the Bonnie and Clyde movie uh, came out of Hollywood kind of epitomizes this. And so I was really interested to know how long did it take law enforcement and government to get their arms around this, you know, robbing a bank branch? Like, when did that not really become a thing anymore? Like, when was that really under control? And so as I did the research, I found something that was absolutely stunning to me, which was it was not until the 1990s so something that started in 1920s, 1930s, it wasn't until the 1990s that bank branch robbery really got so under control that it, yeah, it still happens, but it's really not a thing anymore. We've really got everything, uh, you know, really screwed down as much as possible to where if you do end up in a, in a bank branch with a gun, you're not going to get much money. And the money you do get is going to be marked. It's going to have a die pack in it and so on and so on and so on. Um, you know, so we've got it all figured out. And so I was wondering, like, well, why did it take 60 years to actually get this figured out? And one of the big reasons why it took that long is because the banks were very, very reluctant to follow the lead of law enforcement and do things like put barriers between customers and tellers and so on and so forth, because banking had been a very a relationship driven industry it still is and and the banks really did not want to put barriers between their staff and their customers and it took a long 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 time for private industry to figure out how to how to cooperate and how to come along with what you know the government was encouraging and so i can't help but to wonder you know what's it going to be like in this situation where we need a lot of private industry compromise and support um you know, to, to try to make a, a dent on this. Uh, Michael, did any, did you guys talk about this, about, you know, like the fact that we're breaking new ground and that it's going to be difficult and, you know, what's going to be done about that? Yeah, no, I think you raise a lot of interesting points. And I think, you know, we don't, we can't wait 60 years for this, right? I mean, this past weekend, we saw JBS go down, Colonial went down. I think what's interesting is that if Colonial Pipeline was shut down for another, I think, five days, if it was 10 days in total, uh, the Atlanta airport would have shut down because airplanes have no more fuel. So, I mean, that is going from banks to shutting down one of the largest air, uh, airport systems in the country. So we had to figure this out. Yeah, that's. And I think what's interesting is that to your point that we need private sector involvement, this is a nonprofit, right? I mean, it's, it's not necessarily private, but it's still not federal government that operated and ran with this task force. And that's the kind of involvement that we need when it comes to cybersecurity. And I think a lot of the recommendations we had was all about how can the government work in tandem with private sector and also improve that relationship because we know we we need them. Because at the end of the day, it's it's cryptocurrency, which is all private sector run, and it's 
uh, ICT networks uh, that it's all private sector run. So at the end of the day, the government needs to rely on the private partners to really get at this issue. It's true. And and I think, you know, one of the big challenges here is that we, we, I mean, this is in a lot of ways, this is the preventative health dilemma for government, right? Just with citizens, you know, how do you force people to take care of themselves so that they are less of a burden on, you know, society later on? Um, there's obviously not a real good answer for that. I do think though, that whereas it might be considered a little uh, tyrannical to mandate that everyone exercise for 30 minutes every day or, I don't know, face jail time or something. Um, it is not, I think, anything like that in terms of you know, mandating that companies take certain steps to protect themselves from ransomware or if it comes down to it, um, that it's illegal to pay ransoms. And we've kind of seen that, you know, the the October 1st uh, OFAC memo was sort of along those lines, not precisely. And there's a lot of issues with with enforcement and, and you know, identifying the, uh, you know, attribution, identifying the actor. Uh, but, but, you know, because of the the sudden, or not even the sudden, but the, the pandemic driven explosion in in significant ransomware events, you know, I think I think what what we need to see is, you know, Kip and I can can talk and have talked until we're blue in the face about, you know, this is what you can do, this is how you can do it, kind of from a cyber risk management perspective. What what are the actions uh, that the ransomware task force is recommending? Like, what what types of things are you really looking at for to tell people to do? And it, I imagine it can't be a real long list, so. So what do you like? How many are there? What are your what, what's the idea? You know what, what what's funny? I was kind of you know people can't see my face. I was laughing a bit because last time uh, the report that we talked about was a hundred plus pages, and that was a long thing to get through. And even this one is eighty pages, which is really long to get to with, with forty eight recommendations. But the task force did a good job of uh, identifying five key recommendations, and I think uh, I want to touch on three of them, which is coordinating air national diplomatic and law enforcement efforts with private sector and emphasis on with private sector. Uh, second being establishing a cyber response and recovery fund, which I'll get into the nuances of that, but essentially how can we make sure that we can provide uh, financial grants or funds to victims, including private uh, sector victims. And then lastly, and I think probably the more interesting conversation, and I think they're all interesting, but this is the one that's been uh, really hot in the news, is regulating cryptocurrencies that enable ransomware. Um, and I think to go back to Kip's earlier point in terms of how can we maybe, is this a new thing, or maybe we could take existing law, this is an area in which we have anti mundering laws that we can use and implement on cryptocurrencies. After we do that, maybe we need something else, but uh, that's an area in which that um, we could talk more about in terms of what that kind of regulation would look like. That's really interesting. Uh, we should definitely talk about that. Uh, and I think, um, you know, these are these are interesting actions. These aren't actions that we're recommending that you know individual companies or potential victims take. These are broader societal scale actions. Is that is that intentional? What's what do you think about that? Like what? Yeah, I think this is how can we make sure that we raise the the sea level for all boats, and these are large government actions that can do that. To be sure, we have recommendations in there for private sector companies such as, and, and these, these aren't necessarily groundbreaking, but it's interesting when you see when ransomware attacks happen that they're not in place, such as, do you have backup servers? Uh, do you have paper plans? Uh, because once a ransomware attack hits, you don't have access to your, your computers. And so it, it's funny that you can have a really robust ransomware plan of what happens, but if you don't have to print it out, then it's no good for you. So we have those kind of recommendations as, as well. Uh, but the ones I think I'm raising here and the ones that the task force raised is that these are ones that would do a giant leap forward in terms of diminishing the impact and the prevalency of ransomware incidents, whereas the other ones are more, you're going to get hit. So what can you do to, uh, you know, improve and bolster your systems for the day that you might get hit. 
Interesting. Yeah. I, and and I do want to talk about these. Uh, I believe there's five core actions in the in the ransomware task force rec- recommendations. Um, just just mention, please mention the fourth and fifth, even though I don't think we'll have time to discuss them in any detail. Yeah. So top of my head, um, they're escaping me, but um, I can pull them up here in, in a bit. But I do know that they were really focusing on how we can do disruption operations. So how can the FBI, Interpol, as well as say Microsoft team up together to uh, take down those types of international actors um, and in a legal way. Um, and, and we can get into this a little bit later, but it was interesting because I was listening to an earlier podcast that was talking about how say AT&T can go down and shut off access to servers to clients who are abusing their terms of service. That is totally within the right of AT&T and other providers to do that. However, there may be some concerns of, I mean, Jake, you mentioned earlier about attribution. Am I really sure that this person I'm going after and, and tackling is actually an actor or maybe they're part of a botnet system? Um, that's really difficult. And I think the fifth one really was more about international engagement writ large. How can we ensure that we, we help our allies and partners that their law enforcement uh, capabilities are up to snuff when it comes to pursuing actors either within their own borders and also teaming up to ensure that nation state actors that either abet or actively help uh, cyber criminals like like Russia and China, how can we impose consequences on them that are meaningful uh, and that would change their behavior? Yeah, that's that's really, I think those are all very important, interesting concepts. Let's let's talk a little bit about the the three that we that we mentioned. And you know, I think coordinating international diplomatic and law enforcement efforts kind of speaks for itself. I mean, it, it's fairly clear. It's it's an ongoing battle. Uh, there've there've been plenty of success stories. I mean, Interpol, that's what it's for. I, I think that I think that's probably the easiest one in a sense to like make real progress on just because there's so many there's so many there's there's a lot of history there amongst at least at least the cooperative countries. And maybe that's the issue is you know the if the criminals are housed or or living in countries that aren't cooperative that you can't get coordination across international boundaries. So I, I don't know if that's something that we should spend a ton of time on because I don't think we can solve it. Um, well, I am, that's one thing that I that that is one thing though that I want to point out in, and I want to ask Michael about. It's one thing to say, you know, we here's here's what we need to do. Right, we need more international and diplomatic uh, law enforcement cooperation. Fine. But how do you do that, right? How do you do that with people who have not historically been cooperative and have no current incentive to become cooperative? Like, how does that, you know what I mean? Like the how part. And I, I think that's what's stymieing uh, us from making progress and moving forward is there's, there's, there's no clear, I haven't seen a clear how do you do it, a clear roadmap for how do you do this. And I think our... Um, just as much as when when criminals were robbing banks in the U.S. in the 1920s and 30s and exploiting gaps in our law enforcement and um, and legal system, th- this is what we have on an international level. But we we, we don't have a single government. Um, I mean, we had a federal government in the U.S. that could um, kind of intervene and and assume some authority on these interstate matters, but. There's really nothing comparable uh, for us in um, uh, on the world stage. I, I don't know, Michael. What do you? Yeah, think? no. I mean, I think it, it seems kind of all for naught, right? Uh, Biden issued economic sanctions against those who are responsible for the solar winds attack, and then you had a colonial happen, and then again we put out statements saying this is unacceptable, and then you had JBS happen. So it seems like we're not having a, a big deterrence effect. And deterrence is a real uh, question here. Uh, so one thing that we've written about, and it, it comes up a bit in the uh, Ransomware Task Force paper as well, is we need to identify what are the characteristics that will actually work. Sometimes economic sanctions that is jointly issued by not only the US, but also the EU and other allies will be very, very impactful. However, we haven't really done that in the past, and we're just starting to do that. So coordination in that level will be really impactful. Sometimes it's withdrawing or withholding military and other humanitarian assistance. That could be very impactful as well. 
Other times it might be some kind of a carrot uh, and, and we have to identify those carrots. But I think as well that we're, we're gradually seeing success in terms of bringing together folks in a coherent manner to take down infrastructure and criminals. And I think one story that did not gain much attention that I think it should have is, is uh, uh, Emotet. Emotet was one of the largest malware distributors for the past decade. And it took us a decade, which was far too long, to finally shut down the infrastructure. And it was the multinational uh, with private sector involvement to take them down. And we actually arrested uh, criminals. So this, is, this can happen. Uh, and we, I think yeah. elevating those case yeah. studies to show that, you know, yeah. this, this is worthwhile, is useful. But we're still in the, in the um, what I would call the heroic exception phase. In other words, yep, we had a major victory there, but look, but look what it took, right? It took a decade and it took a lot of heroics. We don't have a systematic, scalable way of dealing with this. And I also strongly suspect that, that once that Emotet was dissembled, uh, disassembled that the actors that did not get arrested regrouped and probably just you know spun up new operations. Absolutely, I, I think I think you're you're spot on. Um, but I don't think it. What I worry about is that that's seen then as an excuse to not keep trying to do something right, and and it's more of well, what's the lesson learned and how yes. can we do it? Um, yeah. So I'm definitely not offering that right. as an excuse to not do anything. I'm just simply offering it as as an explanation mm -hmm. to help people understand why this is so dang difficult. Right. And I think this is the... It's, it's so hard. And I think just just real quick point, because this is actually a really fascinating point of this, is that we have to make the decision. Is it worthwhile to try to identify where the bad actors are and let them continue to launch attacks so we can get uh, the TTPs to identify them? Or is it hurting so badly that we just got to shut it down? You shut down the infrastructure and you just, it's kind of whack-a-mole. And those are two equities we have to kind of balance. And we do need a coherent matter and forum to make those decisions rather than ad hoc basis. So completely agree with you on that front. And I, th and I think the incentives are not well aligned, even on the side of the people who are trying to uh, uh, extinguish this force. So you talked a moment ago, Michael, about how well AT and T can go down to their data center and and disable servers that are uh, being operated by people who violate their terms of service. You know, yes, they can. However, it is not in their best interest to do that because why? They're going to take a revenue hit. And and we've seen it. You can study it. You can study um, the uh, the links that you have to go through in order to take down um, a server that is known to be causing trouble. Like let's say spam. Just spend just you know, a server that sends a ton of spam. Well, that server is consuming a lot of resources and paying a lot of typically a lot of money to the hoster to the hosting provider. So they're typically um, based. And this is not you know this is based on on, on actual behavior in the past, but. Um, you know, they're typically going to let that thing run as long as they possibly can get away with it to, um, to, you know, to generate revenue for themselves. So not, not every hosting provider, I, I, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I just want to point out that, um, that there are, there are some definite conflicts of interest, even on the side of the people who are, who are trying to do the right thing. And those incentives have to be, uh, changed as well. Indeed, and I, I would. I, we're we're going to get a close on time here, and I, I would love to talk about the Cyber Response and Recovery Fund for just a little bit because that, to me, is that that's a truly outside the box proposal, at least compared to kind of the other things that we're talking about. Um, and I'm curious what the thinking is behind that. Is there any concern that having that fund available will maybe disincentivize people from from you know, taking care of themselves and just kind of relying on that fund to to get back up and operational or to you know, uh, you know, I guess recover damages. Like, what, what's the idea there? Yeah, I think you know, avoiding tragedy to comments is very important here. And I think with the fund, and this is something that in President Biden's budget, he actually put twenty million dollars to do a pilot program of this. That there needs to be some strings attached. So if you're going to receive this fund, you need to uh, report that you got hit with ransomware and give us some information to the U.S. government, to an, a non-regulatory agency to ensure that we're not victimizing the victim, which is very important. But also, 
maybe it's you receive the fund the first time, but the second time you're going to, have to show us what improvements you made, or you're going to implement the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework in order to receive the first batch of funds. So there's definitely going to be strings rather than a slush fund approach. But I think one thing that I'll kind of point to is that we really do this in the public sector when it comes to hurricanes. A hurricane comes along and destroys some businesses and some uh, uh, schools. There is a FEMA program to give grants out. And as part of that, you have to show that you're building back and improving what you've, you've lost. This will be something very similar, except you can open it up for uh, both preventive and recovery efforts for private sector businesses. But I, I agree. I think the devil's in the details in terms of what's going to be required and incumbent upon those who receive those funds. Because what last, time, last thing we want to do is for folks to think, well, I can just use this. I don't have to worry about getting cyber insurance or getting some kind of cybersecurity vendor to do my firewalls and network monitoring. Uh, so that, that those are really good, excellent points. And we don't really have good answers for those yet. So we've got we to don't. figure that out as well. So, yeah, so we're a long, gosh, it's discouraging. I feel like, you know, the, you know, this is a good report. I've, I've read it and I, and I think it reflects some very, very good thinking, but we're just still so far away from having this uh, sorted out. And I hate to say it because I know a lot of people are going to be very unhappy to hear this, but it might end up being that the fastest way out of this mess is to just is to just seriously increase our regulation of, of cryptocurrency. Ooh, that's going to be because an unpopular that, thing to do, know, given, given the entire the... point. It, actually, just an interesting question as we talk about this, think, just to think about it. Is it even possible to regulate cryptocurrency or isn't the point of cryptocurrency to be somewhat immune to government regulation? Yeah, I know. It's this isn't is this isn't this is not an easy answer either. But it's I think it's more tractable. If I was if I was a policymaker in government and I was asking myself where could I get the most traction uh, quickest, I I would seriously be thinking about cryptocurrency regulating it. Um, and I don't know what that regulation looks like. But if you think about it, it's it that. The availability of anonymous uh, transactions at scale is a key enabler. And I think without it, I don't think ransomware would be as prevalent as it is today. Well, I agree that that's the case. My question is, is, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, that's, that's a big, it's, it's a big issue. It's going to be really interesting. It's a huge issue, right? Yeah. Because I, and I get it. Your point is well made. But I just wanted to take a moment and speculate about maybe the real answer is someplace different <laughs> than all this uh, all this stuff we've been talking about on the episode. But anyway, so we are running out of time, and I want to respect our listeners' time. So, Michael, this the report from the task force. How should our listeners be thinking about this report? I mean, we've we've talked about it, but I mean, what, what, how should they really be thinking about it? What should and and is there anything they should be doing with? Yeah. It? So I think two things. I think in terms of thinking about it. You can you can track to see what the government is doing, and we've actually been seeing some good movement on that front. So, for example, the recovery fund we just mentioned uh, that was in President Biden's budget. There is a law that has been, or a bill, I should say, that's moving through Congress. Um, in terms of the cryptocurrency thing we're just talking about, the IRS just came out saying that they're going to propose propose regulation that if you receive ten thousand dollars in cryptocurrency, you have to report it. It's baby steps, but I think we could follow that to see if the needle is moving forward at all. And second, in terms of what they can do, again, it's going back to the blocking and tackling, but ensuring you have a ransomware plan of what happens if, if you were to get hit uh, and make sure that's best printed out. And also reaching out to government partners like DHS or Secret Service or FBI, which if you don't have pre-existing uh, relationships, I, I know that's kind of daunting, but they are actually very useful and can be there to help. Um, and also join your local either ISAL or ISAC or some kind of information sharing body because there's so much information that could be shared and you can identify uh, trends and tactics that adversaries are using to defend yourselves and you just get involved in a huge community that could be very, very helpful. I agree right. on that completely. Okay. Thank you, Michael, so much for being our guest. 
for for uh, bringing this report to us and helping us kind of unpack what's going on with ransomware, what could be done about it, what should be done about it. We really appreciate you uh, being here today. But um, so as we wrap up, do you want to uh, tell everybody how they can find you on the internet and um, and anything else that you want to mention? Yeah, no. So you can find me if you just Google Michael Garcia Third Way. I'm on there. If you want to read the report. Uh, again, IST ransomware, and it'll pop up. Um, and I just give it a read. And there's a lot of good articles out there. And yeah, just, just pay attention to this issue because it's not going to go away. And I think increasingly it's going to be on top of the agenda for the administration and other air national governments. Yeah, I think that's right. All right. That wraps up this episode of the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Today, we talked about the recommendations that were released by the Institute for Security and Technologies ransomware task force because we've got to do something about the growing threat of ransomware and i want to thank michael garcia for helping us to do that and we will see you next time see you next time thanks for joining us today on the cyber risk management podcast remember that cyber risk management is a team sport so include your senior decision makers legal department hr and it for full effectiveness So if you want to manage cyber as the dynamic business risk it has become, we can help. Find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and focallaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.